my, my daughter's two years old. She's really into this uh, Mav City song lately called uh, Miracles on Miracles. It's such a great song. And uh, it's, uh, it's really cute because she'll be singing it. She goes, miracles on miracles. I don't even know how it goes. But the next part goes, one, two, three, four. I can't even count them all. And I'm like, that's so beautiful. And she's two and she sings this. And, and one of the reasons why I love it is because she's learning how to count just by singing the song, right? So I'm like, this is good. She's counting to four. Sometimes she skips five or six. She'll get to ten one way or another. Uh, but the other thing that I love about it is she's like, I can't even count them all. The thing that I love about this song is it's just getting her in a frame of mind as she grows up that we should expect miracles to take place in our life. We should see miracles in things that maybe... We don't normally see because our God is powerful, amen? God is a miracle working God. And so I think sometimes we need to be aware of the miracles. Like our lungs are working right now. We're alive. We're, 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 we exist. Can you, like the, the, that baby up here, that came out of the, the, the mother's womb. And that whole thing is a miracle. How did that happen? And I think we need to, uh, we, we need to be expecting that God is so good. He's a miracle working God. And I think when we have that expectation, right, it draws us in to a depth with the Lord who wouldn't have otherwise, right? How many of you know today God wants you to know him and to know him be, uh, deeper than the surface level? God wants you to experience him, not just say his name and act like he's out there. God is alive and active and he's powerful. And so miracles should be a part of your experience. But how often is it just not? How often is the walk of faith, if you will, more, uh, what do we call it, mundane, more, dare I use the word, monotonous. Uh, for some people, religion is nothing but monotonousness. Monotony. Well, however you say it. What does that even mean? I'm from Chowchilla too. Let me read the definition. <laughs> My people. Monotonous. Boring. Okay. Uh, dull. Repetitive. Lacking in variety or interest. I love one definition said, mind numbing. This is uh, the journey of religion for so many people. And over time, it's just like, wow, another routine. That was boring and boring. And then you know what happens if this is your spiritual life over time? Eventually, you will walk away. And if you don't because you hold on with stubbornness to your monotonous religion, guess what? Your kids will. They will not hold on to monotonous, mind-numbing, boring religion. I'm just telling you, we don't live in that world anymore. The world is changing so your faith better be alive. There better be something to inspire the next generation because they will sniff out fake really fast. And so how do we walk by faith in a way that's like, dude, miracles on miracles, right? And we've seen God move and you better believe we're going to see him move again. And so God is a God that invites you into the supernatural. All I'm saying is, as your pastor today, I don't want mind-numbing to be your experience, right? I want, I want miraculous experience. I want amazing things. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you into a text today because the reality is, is it's one thing to say all that. But if you're saying, man, I'm going to live a life where at the end of my day, right, I've seen miracles on miracles. A million little miracles, right? If that's actually going to be your story, that somebody at your, your funeral is going to be like, man, God surrounded that person. There was just so much happening. How many of you know today that there's a method to all of that? It doesn't happen by accident. If at the end of your life you actually want to have a deep relationship with God, well, you've seen him move mountains that you didn't know could be moved, right? Guess what? It's not an accident. There's a method to the miracles on miracles. And so I'm going to draw you in, and hopefully we can learn about that from Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It says this. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered into Capernaum. 
And uh, just a little context, you say, when Jesus got done saying all this, what was he saying, right? Because he's about to walk into Capernaum. Capernaum's where Peter lived, and this is where Jesus is going to do ministry in uh, just north of the Sea of Galilee. And what, he's, what, what the text is saying, when, when Jesus get done, got done saying all these things, is he just got done preaching the most famous sermon of all time. If you've been in church for a little while in your life, or you read your Bible, there's this famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, because he preached a sermon on a mountain. And he preached this sermon on a mountain because there was like thousands of people that showed up. And it's the most epic sermon ever. It like takes you to just all kinds of places and, and, it, and, it, and it challenges you and it cha- disrupted everything back then about what they knew about religion. And he starts off this sermon, right, talking to thousands of people and he says, blessed. How many of you today, give me a hand, come on, if you want to live a blessed life. Okay, okay. So this matters to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit, is what he said. Spiritually poor people, bankrupt in your spirit. I am broken. I cannot fix myself. I am messed up. I am separated from God by my own actions. I've got a problem. And here comes Jesus in the face of religion and says, no, you who have a recognition of your brokenness inside, blessed are you. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Guess what? Because they will inherit the kingdom of God. What? Slap some religious people real quick. (laughs) Blessed are the spiritually messed up? Yeah. That's what Jesus said. And then he starts saying some other things. Blessed are the, the, the meek. Blessed are the, he said, blessed are those who show mercy. Ain't that a word for us today? Because they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure, right, in, in heart, which means I just, I just want God. I'm broken, but I just want God. It says, because they will see God. They will see him. That's why I said, don't you want to see God move? Right? And so he starts preaching this sermon. It's just messing with people. And then he comes down the mountain. And have you ever just asked yourself, okay, if Jesus just preached the most epic sermon of all time, all right, what's he going to do next? So this, woo, can't you tell I'm excited about this text, is what happens next. Let's just put it this way. Jesus did the talking, now he's going to do the walking. How many of you know today your faith means nothing if you do the talking, but you don't do the walking, right? So we could talk all day about faith and facts and knowledge. But if there's no walking it out, what are we even doing? So he's just did the talking. Now, let's see some walking. It says in verse 2, there was a centurion servant. A centurion's servant. So that's two things to know real quick. Whom his master highly valued. He was sick. He was about to die. The centurion had heard of Jesus. That's it. He only heard of Jesus. Never saw Jesus. And he sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and to heal his servant. And so this is such a fascinating story. Because you have a Roman centurion. That's a big deal, by the way. If you're a Roman, that matters. You have a certain status in Israel. You're Roman, right? And Rome, by the way, had taken over the, that whole province. So if you're Rome, you, you, you had, you know, special... Uh, status okay he's not only Roman he's a Roman officer not only is he a Roman officer it says that he's a centurion which comes from the word centa right which which means 100 so he had authority he had power he had people underneath him he had uh, centa means you at least oversaw 100 servants and soldiers so this guy's a big deal right at least 100 people and the norm in that day was if you're a Roman soldier you didn't really care that much about people's health You didn't really care about their struggles, especially if they were a servant. So I don't know if you noticed in the text. It said that a servant was sick. It didn't even say one of his soldiers was sick. It said that he had a servant that was sick. And the norm would be, I don't care. Forget that guy. We don't have time for him. We've got too much going on. Like if it was a soldier, maybe we might, you know, send him a care package. If it's a servant, he could die. 
We don't care. Get, replace him. So I'm just setting the stage for that's what's normal. Now, what I just read was abnormal. Did you catch that? So here you have a Roman officer who cares for someone that the world says you don't need to care about. And I just think there's something powerful. As we get into this story about somebody who cares for somebody they're not technically supposed to care about. Because how often in culture do we see people who climb the ladder of success stop caring about people at the bottom. And yet here's somebody who has been given a position in society. He goes, no, a servant is sick and I'm, I care for him like family. This is somebody who is so aware of other people's needs. Because again, when I tell you there's a method to the miracle, you got to hear me because it starts with humility inside. I, I'm not better than everyone else. I do care for other people. People who often get overlooked. There's a method to this faith. And so there's this humble thing. He cares for a servant like their family. Listen, some people don't even care for their family like their servants. We just don't care. We just elevate and forget everyone else. And again, this, I'm saying all this because this person's going to get Jesus' attention. And so this is super powerful. How you treat the people below you will dictate the treatment you get from the God above you. So it matters. It matters how you think people are beneath you. And so look at verse 4. It says, they came to Jesus. Who, who came? The Jewish elders did. They pleaded earnestly. That's not just pleading. They plead earnestly with him. They said, this man deserves for you to do this because he loves our nation and he has built our synagogue. Okay, another fascinating part about this is culturally speaking, Romans and Jews did not like each other. The Jews didn't appreciate Roman occupation in Israel. Romans are the ones who brought crucifixion into the culture and persecuted Jews all the time. So notice the difference here though. Here you have Jewish people who are friends with Roman people. Not just friends, but they're the Jewish elders. And not only his friends, they're the ones who go seek Jesus out. Could you imagine? You're supposed to be enemies, and yet the Jewish elders are actually going to chase Jesus down, not just to plead for this guy, but to plead earnestly for him. Isn't that crazy? Like, who is this guy? <laughs> He's so opposite of the norm. And they go, no, this guy, he deserves it. Why? Because he built our synagogue. Guess who doesn't enjoy synagogues? Romans. You notice anything different about this guy? Isn't it crazy? It's, it's crazy to me that somebody would invest their finances into a thing that they don't even benefit from just to bless the community. That is wild. And so they, who are, they're not even in his camp. They don't even usually like Roman people. The Jewish elders are like, no, we're going to bat for this guy. He's a humble guy and he's a generous guy. I told you guys, there's a method. He has a humble spirit and he has a generous heart. And again, it's going to get Jesus' attention. He's there for the community. He cares. He uses his status He uses to help. People, he builds their synagogue. And I just think, again, how much do we invest in things that only help us? What would the people outside of our community say about us? We get so locked in our little community. Unless you bless anyone outside of that community lately? I heard a story recently. It was amazing about a guy, huge supporter of the local uh, uh, private school where they live. Believes in the education, private education, Christian education. Goes and writes their biggest check every year. And then the thing that I got the backstory on was then he leaves that school, goes to the inner city school, and writes the same check. Isn't that powerful? Nobody knows that. But it kind of reminds me of this guy. He goes, I'm here for beyond my own clan. I'm here to be a blessing. And why am I setting you up like this? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. 
verse 6. So Jesus, ready, went. It's cool. <laughs> so Jesus went with them. And check this out. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent more friends to him to say to him, Lord, this is what he said, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Again, that's the centurion who's high up in culture, who's financially well off, who's blessing everybody behind the scenes. And yet he looks at Jesus and goes, no, I don't deserve it. But did you catch in the line prior to that, the Jewish elders were going, he does deserve it. And I went, how unique is this? Because again, when I look in our culture all the time, I see people who go, I deserve this, I deserve this. And everybody around them is going, no, you don't. You don't deserve jack. You're a prick. <laughs> Can I be real today? Is that okay? I'm like, how the opposite is that? He's literally telling God, I don't deserve it. And the community is going, yes, he does. I just think, again, there's method. There's humility that cares for other people. There's generosity that gives when people don't see where you give. There's a nature between you and God where you're like, I don't deserve anything, God. But you're a gracious God, so I'm going to ask. So he says, he says, you don't even have to come. You could just stay there, right? And I just found how often it is true that entitlement is so attached to lack of empathy. I deserve it. It's me. It, look at me. But I don't empathize with no one else. It's crazy. But here you have the exact opposite. And here, here's the crazy thing. Ready? This will help somebody. It's going to hurt, but it's going to help. The more you think you deserve God's favor in your life, the more you're actually pushing it away. God's grace comes to the humble. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. So again, here you have somebody who's saying, I don't even deserve that you come under my roof. And again, wh why does this matter? Because Jesus had just taught, blessed are the poor in spirit. He just taught that, now we're walking in that, right? Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Blessed are the merciful. You know what he didn't say? Blessed are the complainers, y'all. They will get what they want. Just write it on social media enough times. The Lord will come through. It, it doesn't actually say blessed are the stingy, because they will save up enough. It doesn't say blessed are the proud, they're going to get the kingdom. I'm just, i got to be really clear. These are Jesus' words, right? They're walking, now they're talking. They're talking, now they're walking. In verse 7, he says, this is why... I, uh, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. I love this. He says, just say the word. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. This is so good. And again, this matters because he's like, man, don't come to my house. He said, I, I don't really have that high of a view of myself. And this is the problem. Sometimes we think we're the best thing that ever happened in this world since sliced bread, old reference, since like Apple, right? Or, 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 or so, some iPhone or something, right? Let me, let me give you a newsflash. You are not, and neither am I. Some of us need to realize we're not the savior of the world. Jesus is. And when you get your eyes off yourself, you realize, man, he's the one I can actually turn to to do something about it. So this guy, he had a low view of himself. He looked at the world just like you and me do, and he saw problems. He looked at his own life and his own house, and he saw problems. But he knew he's not the answer. And I want to free somebody today to realize you're not the answer. You, ha you have your place in it, but, but you're not the Savior. And so again, it, it leads him to go to Jesus and go, man, and, and here, here's the reality. You know what faith actually is? It's dependency. Are you dependent on Jesus? Are, are you, it, because here's the thing. If you're dependent on him to come through, you'll find yourself desperate to go to him. You'll find yourself seeking him. You'll find yourself going, I need to get with him. Because I'm so desperate for him. Why? Because I'm dependent on him. I'm not the answer. He is. And so I'm going to go talk to him. And so again, this, my whole point of today's message is to be real practical for us. Is that your faith, which is your ability to depend on God and trust in him, has everything to do with your prayer life. 
Your prayer life says so much about your desperation, what you actually feel about God in your life, and your situations that you're going through. Your prayer life. Because the reality is, all of us, uh, if we don't think we need him, we won't go to him. We'll try to do it ourselves. And here's the thing, even if you can do it yourself, pray about it, because God can still do it better. We put so much pressure on ourselves, right? Put so much pressure on ourselves. And God goes, no, come to me. And, and what's, what's powerful too, I, I pointed that out earlier, but did you realize he had never seen Jesus? Because how often times do we think we need to see before we believe? This guy had only heard of Jesus, just like us. So can you have a faith that moved mountains and you've never seen Jesus with your eyes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so this guy has a faith, right? God is powerful. There's methods to the miracles on miracles. Faith is about humility, generosity. And then also, listen to me, understanding that God has authority. Look at verse 8. He says... For I myself am a man under authority. Uh, I have soldiers that are underneath me, and if I tell one to go, he's going to go. And, and then if I tell another one to come, he's going to come over. And then if I say to my servant, go do this, he's going to do it, right? And so this is why he transfers his understanding of his authority as a Roman officer and goes, listen, it must be the same with God. If God has authority, guess what? If he wants to do something, it gets done, <laughs> Right? And so he goes, if I tell somebody to go do it, they better not blink at me. It gets done. And he has the same belief about Jesus. I want to just challenge via church this morning. Listen, do you believe if Jesus just says the word, it has to happen? Do you believe your God is that powerful? I just wonder if you have a say the word kind of faith. Oh, I know. If God just said it, it has to happen. And you will believe that if you believe he has all authority in heaven and on earth, like the word says. He sits at the right hand of the Father, right? That he is all powerful, all knowing that his will will be done in the end. So again, if you believe he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and he's everything in between, what you're going to do is you're going to talk to him. And you're going to say, I don't want to do this without you. I need you. And all you have to do, Jesus, is say the word. There's something about a faith that believes in the authority of God. Some of us today, the reason why we don't pray is we don't believe the authority. That he has all authority. That word all really means all. So, so we should act like it's all authority. Look at verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was, this is my favorite part. When Jesus heard this, he was, what's the word? He, it's up there, right? All right, let me try that again. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. I want you to think for a second. Jesus is the all-knowing, eternal son of God. He was just amazed. Can you believe that? That's crazy. Jesus was amazed. I just think you got to stop for a second and let that sink in. He was amazed. And then he turns to the crowd and he punks them. Is that up there? No. He says, I tell you that I haven't found this great of faith even in Israel. Let me just remind you for a second. Who's Israel? The people of God. Who is Jesus amazed at? A Roman. <laughs> Ooh. Ouch. He just said in front of the whole crowd, you guys were raised in church. That's going to sting a little. Just hang in there. Your parents were believers. You went to private school. They did. You were told your whole life about the miracles of God. And this other guy raised as a pagan in pagan culture. 
Oh, in the public school. Didn't go to Sunday school growing up. Let me just ask you, who amazed Jesus Christ? And again, I'm not saying that to pick on one or the other. I'm just saying, ask yourself that question. Would Jesus be amazed at your faith? Or is it routine and mundane and monotonous? Or do you believe he has authority? This is wild. This is wild. Again, the Roman guy. Jesus tells the crowd, I haven't even seen that in the church. That's so crazy. Did you know in the Bible Jesus is amazed two times? That's it. One time is this time. The other time he's in his hometown where everybody knows Jesus. And he says miracles can't happen here. I'm amazed at your lack of faith. Did you see the tie to miracles and faith? And people who know Jesus and then people who only barely heard of him? I'm always amazed. People walk in, no church background, no nothing, been through all kinds of stuff. They come and they taste and they see that the Lord is good. They get wild in their prayer life. They believe God actually can move mountains. Somebody can read that in the Greek and never see it in life. It's amazing. Jesus said, no, that guy, I'm amazed at him. That's amazing. He actually believes this stuff is real. It's wild. Again, this is just challenging for me. Guess what? I went to a private school. Okay? So I have to ask myself, do I believe? At the end of the day, is Jesus going to be looking at me and going, that was awesome. That was amazing. I can't believe you trusted me like that. And it impacted you. And you had faith, right? That's crazy. So again, we just ask ourselves the question. We're here to grow, right? And so again, faith is not what you believe about yourself. Some of you would, you would, would say my Christian status is based on these three facts that I know. It's not on the facts you know, it's in the fruit that you show. It's in the, what flows out of your life. It's not what you believe about yourself, it's what you believe about God and how that impacts you to go live it out. And so again, this is, a, this is Jesus is amazed. And I just, I just wonder, this is a reality, ready? It, it hurts, but it's so, it's so healthy to have this conversation. You can go to church your whole life, listen to me, and not live by faith. So we have to ask ourselves, am I living by faith? And if we're not, it's going to get monotonous and mind-numbing <laughs> and routine. Or we can have a belief in Jesus that he's on the throne, that he's powerful, that he's good, that he's gracious, that he's in this world, that he's going to do something, that I don't have to run in fear, that I can walk with my God, that he's powerful. And so that's my dream and my prayer for this church. At the end of the day, I want, I want, I want man, it would be so amazing if in heaven God said, via church, I was amazed. You guys really believed I, I was powerful. Your world looked dark, but you thought, you know what, God is a light. And he can do something. He's more powerful than what you fear. And faith receives that. Faith believes that. Look at verse 10. It says, then the men who had, sent, had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. The end. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Because you just got this great sermon, right? And then boom. the ve So again, I have to keep highlighting. This is the very next thing the Holy Spirit chose to put in the Bible. Like keep reading. It wasn't just the talking. Here, let's see the walking. Let's see this play out. And again, I, I just read the miracle, but I spent most of the time on the method. Because so oftentimes we talk about the miracles, but I got to get into the thick of it. Why did this happen? Who was this person? What was the details in it? Because it, not everything's the same. So again, this guy had a high view of God, low view of himself. He said, I don't deserve it. And then everyone around him says, yes, you do. He had a generosity in his community. This is a person who cared for people who didn't really always get cared for. And this is a guy whose belief was that my God has authority and can do something if he just says the word. And he amazes Jesus. And then you get this amazing miracle that takes place and so again in, in our life as we talk about our own faith today I would just ask you what does your talks with God look like 
Are you desperate because you're dependent on him? What does it look like you, for you to be a person who's continually in prayer? Uh, and, and the amazing thing is, is you don't have to go through Jewish elders to get to Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus gave his life for you. Died on a cross to cleanse you. Tore the veil that separates us and the Father. So listen, we can go freely into the presence of God with clear consciences. With confidence to talk to God. So if God made that available to you, my question is, do you take advantage of that? Do you talk to God with confidence and a clear conscience and call out to Him because you believe He's able and He can move and He's powerful, right? Because here's what I found in my experience all growing up around religion is Christians are notorious for saying, Amen, prayer's great, and then nobody actually prays. Like, do we pray? This is why we brought Unknown back. We had to. We needed a night of prayer and worship. We have to, and we will keep bringing it back. Because you can find out how popular, you know, speakers are by, like, who shows up to listen to them speak. You find out how popular Jesus is on the prayer nights. That, that's what you find out. Like, people actually love Jesus. Let's go be with Jesus tonight. It says something. So, so what does it actually look like? And again, I don't know, man. It, looks, it can look different for a lot of people. My question is, are you processing that, though, for yourself? Like, what does it actually look like to pray? And, and here's, here's something, too, that I think is, is helpful. People go, what if it doesn't work and I look like a fool? Like, what if, I, what if the guy went to the elders and the elders came back and said, nah, Jesus was too busy? Like, what, I mean, you, get, you know he probably had that fear. What if I look like a fool? I'm a Roman. I got to care about my face. I got to save face here. I have, uh, you know, a reputation as a Roman of never being wrong. And, and what if I go and nothing happens, then I look like a fool? And so some of us, we don't pray bold prayers because we're afraid of looking like a fool. We don't share those prayers with other people because we're afraid. But, but here's the thing. You know what I love about this is, because is, I can see what would happen is, 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 one, you'd be afraid to look foolish. Here's the other thing. We get mad at God because he doesn't move the way we expect him to move. And sometimes God will answer prayers differently than you expect. Right, and so, so what if I ask and he says no? Well, here, here's the beautiful thing again about the method of the heart of the person asking. Did you notice all along he said, I don't deserve it. So how can you ever get mad at God for not answering your prayer the way you want him to answer if in the first place you didn't deserve it? Do you see how that doesn't make sense? I deserve it. I deserve it means I'm pushing God away. It's humility that says I don't deserve it either way. But I can ask because it's grace that God moves in. It's not my merits, not my good works. It is the grace of God that I can approach him and ask. You see, there's a big difference there in why you're asking. Sometimes our motives are off. And so he's like, man, if I don't get what I want the way I asked or whatever, then I'm not going to be mad at God because I don't deserve it in the first place. And then my question is, what if he feared it not taking place and he tried to save face so he never did it? Can I tell you what would have happened? His servant probably would have never got healed. Unless someone else stepped up. And so I, I think about that in our own life, right? All the time. Because you could look foolish. Like, you know, in my own life, Monday mornings are my prayer times. I have to, sp I've got a lot to do. But I better start in prayer. And I've got things, I have a prayer list. Every week I print it out. It's got a lot of people's in this room's name on it. And I will pray. Some of those things get answered right away. Some of them, I've been praying for eight years and have seen it only move backwards. I could look at my life and go, I'm wasting my time. What am I doing? It's the beginning of the week. There's plenty of work to do. But I've seen people get healed on that list that I'm not sure would have happened if we not asked for it. So what's the greater risk? What is the greater risk? The time of prayer or that someone might not get their breakthrough because I want to open my mouth. Believers, you're called to be a part of this. 
And so what, is that, what does that actually look like for us? I wrote, a, you know, I have a prayer journal. I pray for this church to get away with God and just write out all my thoughts. And I've seen him do things that I never thought he could do. I've seen him do things so differently than I thought he was going to do them. That you only see in retrospect, wow, that was God. And I've got things on there that haven't, I haven't seen yet. But it's worth the risk. Every time I have a child or a niece or nephew, I write them a letter when they're born. Just like today on the next service, I get to uh, dedicate a nephew. It's so exciting. So I've got all these letters, right? Because God is going to get them. If he just says the word. But somebody better pray. And I want to see that. The day they, they grow up, they get married, they get baptized, whatever. And I go, look at God. He got you. And we were praying for you before it even got started. Just like dedication. This is us going, hey, before you even mess things up or do things right, we believe you're in God's hands. We're going, we're going to God for you. We're going to do it. We're going to, by faith, ask him to move in your life. I wrote my wife a prayer journal for months or a year before I even knew we were going to date. Think about this. How foolish I would be if even today I'm still writing one every week. How foolish I could feel if we never got married, right? I mean, what if I'm 50 and I've been writing every week prayers for her? I guess I could say I never deserved it, right? But the reality is... It was worth the risk. It's worth the risk. It's worth, worth the risk and the time to pray. Because God will often answer ways different or better than you were anticipating. And so again, what does it look like for you and for me to be a people of prayer? And to see God come through on miracles and miracles. I want to tell you a story about a lady. Uh, this lady was born in 1937. Okay, talking about the end of the Depression, right? Towards the end of the Depression, right on into World War II. Born in Holland. Born in a small little town, and, and her earliest years of life were during the war. So crazy stuff is happening. Because, you know, everything that was happening with the war and jet planes and bombers flying over top and crazy stuff happening. And then she had a, a, a mom who had severe mental health issues to where sometimes she'd be completely absent in her role as a mother. And this woman, young girl as she grew up, had to take many responsibilities as, uh, as the mother figure of the house. And there was like 10 kids in the family, okay? It was a heck of a big Dutch family. And so that was a struggle in and itself, just growing up in hard times. And then finally, they immigrated. They immigrated to America. And if you're an immigrant in the house, you know how complicated that can be, how tough that can be. When you're leaving a culture behind and you got to establish a new culture and speak a new language and all the things that you have to overcome when you move like that. She gets married and then they, they, they're working and have three kids. And you know motherhood, moms. That's hard. Three little ones, back to back to back. And her husband gets cancer and dies. It's hard. So that's a lot to go through, right? But she loves the Lord. She gets remarried and says, hey, I'll have three more. <laughs> Six kids. And they, they, again, work hard. They're involved in the church. And then there are six kids, have heck of kids. And by the way, this is my grandma I'm talking about. And uh, a couple months ago, or a month or two ago, I can't remember, time flies, but we celebrated her and my grandpa's 50th, uh, 50th wedding anniversary, which is amazing. It's amazing. And they have, I, I want to get this right because I couldn't believe the numbers. Listen, 30, oh no, 29 grandkids. And 35 great grandkids. Okay, that's a huge legacy. 
Their kids are all involved in the church. They're all involved in the community. They're generous people. They've helped multiple churches grow. Via church, in, in large part, has been by a lot of that generosity in the extended family. They believe in the kingdom. And, and again, miracles on miracles. I want to see miracles. And I look at that, and sometimes miracles are in a moment, amen, right? But sometimes miracles are over a lifetime. And you look at a culture, right, that's confused and falling apart, and then you look at, like, this, this thing, this family, this legacy, and you go, wow, that's a miracle. You just don't notice it. And the crazy thing is of all her prodigals, I'll say all her prodigals, not all of them went prodigal. I definitely went prodigal. That and my older brother. He's in the house today, so I got to give him a... <laughs> Maybe one of the most prodigal in the spirit is now the preacher. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's like a joke. Yeah, you would have to know me for that. But like, it's like, dude, that's hilarious. And here's why I know there's a method, though, to the miracles of over a lifetime. And I'm going to make this quick. When we were kids, we would get shipped off to her house, and it was like boot camp at Oma's house, because she's real disciplined. And she would put us in bed at 6 p.m. Okay, what in the world? So we would go to bed in this dark hallway, heck a long dark hallway. And, you know, being the sneaky one that I was, or maybe just not tired at 6 o'clock, right? Sneak down the hallway, and I remember I did this a couple times. I would sneak to the end of the hallway where their room was, and I would peek in, and like clockwork every time, both of them on their knees in prayer by their bedside. Then the next night I sneak out, I peek in, and finally one day they caught me, like the third day we were staying there, and they're like, hey, come on in. Okay, cool. So we sit there, and they're just praying for everyone. They're like, God, we don't deserve your grace. We don't deserve, I love, it's always like that we don't deserve this kind of stuff. And then they'd start praying for all their friends who had needs, and then they'd start praying for all the kids by name, and the grandkids, and I'll never forget what it felt like to be prayed over, because I believe they were sowing a seed that would come to pass later when they put their hands on me and said, God, get this kid. He needs your grace and, and fill him up. And I just remember like, whoa, that was, that was crazy. But then pretty soon our family was getting so big, I'm like, I ain't sneaking down the hall no more. Like, they're praying for way too long, right? <laughs> That's why they went to bed at six and they didn't be praying for so long. But it just made me think, miracles on miracles, but I think there's a method here. And the funny thing is, even if to this day you go to their house, they're going to make you sit at their table with all their friends. They're 80. They're in their 80s, both of them. They cook meals for everybody in their whole retirement village. They got widows over every night. So if you're going to grandma's, you're going with 20 people. She's cooking for all of them. She's in her 80s. She just gives it out. And you know what she always talks about in her prayers? We don't deserve any of this. And everybody around her is like, no, she does deserve something. I just think, again, there's method to this. That we often overlook, that draws you into the depth of a walk with God. And the last thing I'll share, and then I gotta be quiet. The band, you guys can start making your way up actually, because. Is you know who had nothing to do with the healing in the story? The guy who got healed. He was the answer to someone else's prayer. I just think that's so powerful. The centurion had a hundred people to worry about, leaves them to go worry about the one. You know who thinks like that? Jesus Christ, who leaves the 99 to care about the one. He comes after the one. One of you, you're the one today. God wants you to walk with him. But I'm telling everybody here today, listen, you're probably the result of somebody else's prayer. My question is, who's going to be the result of your prayer now? Don't let it stop with you. This thing's got to keep rolling. We're going to change the world. We're going to help the world. We're going to care for people that get overlooked. But we believe, God, you just say the word. You've got all authority, all power. You're able. Come on, if you're thankful, give them some praise this morning. Why don't you stand up? We're going to have a time of worship. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. We love you. We put our faith in you.